Welcome to Stories of Freedom. This is a podcast about discovering and embracing who you are in Christ. On each episode, you'll hear from people who have overcome obstacles, gained freedom, and found abundant life. Then we'll look back at each interview through a biblical lens and figure out what could apply to your life and your story, because knowing your identity changes everything. Thanks for joining us. We're excited to share these stories and biblical principles. Every believer needs to know who they are in Christ, how to fight the battle for the mind, and how to walk by faith in repentance. Stories of Freedom is a production of Freedom in Christ Ministries. I'm Dan Stute, President of Freedom in Christ Ministries USA. Today's guest is Matt Massingill. Matt is a father, husband, and the recent author of one of our new free resources here at Freedom in Christ Ministries. Matt grew up in a small town in Louisiana where he was exposed to some pretty scary circumstances. Nevertheless, he became a believer at age 15, but didn't really take hold of his faith until 10 years later when he found the book, Victory Over the Darkness. Now Matt uses what he's learned to help others find freedom in Christ and pursue healthy relationships. Here's Matt's story. Well, it is good to be with you today, Matt. Thank you for coming on Stories of Freedom to share your story of how God has worked in your life over the years. Thanks, Dan. Glad to be here today. Thanks for having me. Well, before we really jump in, I just want to ask you, what's one thing you hope our listeners take away from your story today? I guess the main thing would be I had a pretty normal childhood. There was no molestation. There was no really major traumatic events. You know, I was loved by my parents. I had a great childhood, a great family, loved growing up where I did, kind of remote, but it was out on a lake, a little little boy with a boat and a motor and a lake. (laughs) It's all good. But still, there were just patterns that got embedded in my life through just the normal events and the occurrences of life that I've struggled with for 40, 50, 60 years. For people to understand, hey, I have these patterns, even though I didn't have anything major happen, is that normal? And I remember as a pastor, when I would do some pastoral counseling and people would describe to me their situation and how they were feeling, a lot of times they were actually even anxious over how they were feeling. And I would be able to say, well, based on the many stories I've heard over the years, you sound completely normal. And I could see them relax. And so maybe (laughs) today we're, we're hoping that people will be able to relax, but also find the hope that, hey, God can overcome these patterns, these things in my life, just like he helped Matt and his. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Introduce yourself to our audience. Tell us about yourself and your family, whatever you're comfortable. Sure. I was a construction engineer for the first 10 years. That was my education in college, construction management. Built projects uh, mainly in Texas for about nine or 10 years. Decided I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to be like a piece of equipment and be put on a low boy and driven to another location and build another one. So I left that, started as a financial advisor in the late 80s, 1988, the year after the uh, flash crash of 1987. Mm. (laughs) I was calling people less than a year later. They're scared to death of the market, and I'm trying to start new. That was that was a Odd time to start, but did that for over 30 years. Retired in that, sold my business a few years back. Been doing Freedom in Christ for almost 30 years. Still married to the same woman I married out of college. We've been married for 40, eh, better get this right, 43 years. Twin daughters and four grandbabies all here in our town of Nashville. Yeah, wonderful. It's good to have the, the grandkids close. I've joined that club and Love spending time with them. So thanks for sharing. I remember you saying too that being a financial advisor, your your job was just to help people in their fear and greed, right? To deal with some of those flesh patterns because we're talking about money. So that's exactly right. Mm, Wow. Tell us a little bit about you've already said had a normal childhood on a lake, boat, opportunity to get out, but some things happened that started the process of some patterns that developed over the years. Can you tell us what happened in your childhood and how that caused you to begin to perceive yourself? I'll start with this to begin with, Dan. I was a very compliant child. I wanted to make my parents happy. I didn't want to disappoint. I was a performer. I mean, that that got to be a big part of my life was uh, performance-based acceptance. 
So that's kind of before Christ, after Christ, it really didn't change except it intensified because I had this real passionate love for Jesus. I didn't know a lot about him, but I loved him and I didn't want to let him down. I wanted to please. So that was an early pattern. We didn't have kindergarten back in, in my day. We just went to the first grade. So I started school when I was five. So I was one of the youngest. My parents had let me uh, use this little baby language and I spoke with these little words that they understood and they laughed and they thought it was funny. Well, when I got to school, the uh, other kids didn't think that was quite as funny because I didn't talk like they did. I had this baby language. And so that was embarrassing. You know, first thing, people laughing at you. Second thing, you know, write your name on a piece of paper. Well, I couldn't write my name. So that night I got to write it 100 times and I could write it the second day. <laughs> And they used to give you a piece of this brown freezer paper, kind of wrapping paper to draw on at, during art time. Well, art was never my thing. So, I, you know, I drew this little house with the same little thing over and over. And the teacher said, well, son, that's good, but can you draw anything else? I'm like, well, not really. So three strikes you're out in the first, literally the first couple of days. I couldn't write my mm -hmm. name. I was laughed at when I was speaking and art time. So my first inclination is I'm not as smart as these other kids. I don't measure up. That was really the beginning of that. I had a sister that was, you know, very intelligent, graduated high school at 16, was in the accelerated class out of college at 19. And so, you know, I wasn't going to try to compete with that. So I, my competition was more in baseball. Early on, I started getting the pat on the head, the attaboys for you know, you can throw it faster, hit it further or run faster or whatever. So I started getting performance-based acceptance in sports. So I made that my thing. It was, it was all about the sports. 13, 14, I, I had three guys that I grew up with that were like brothers. And one of them had an older brother that was, he was 17, 18 years old. I think when he was a senior, I was probably in the eighth grade. So, you know, five years younger, a lot younger. And he had two other friends and they were, you know, one was the fullback on the football team, you know, big kids. And we would play this little game in my front yard. My front yard kind of held water when it rained too much. And they would, you know, slow motion football and they would just smear us in the mud and just beat up on us. But that was, you know, that was kind of fun. We didn't get hurt, no broken limbs. But the, the one brother of my friend just kept being really... We were playing basketball, I remember, and we were, the two of us, I was on the eighth grade team and my friend was on the ninth and he was on the high school team as a senior and we could beat him two on one and he just didn't like that at all. And so he would push me down. He it was beating up on me and my friend got him off and we got this big fight. Well, I go home with a bloody nose and mm -hmm. a black eye and, you know, my parents go back down and confront him. But I really forgot all about that. I did not remember that as I'm trying to remember my, some things I'll tell you about here in a minute that happened. I, I just, I didn't remember being bullied, but it was a big part. It's almost one of those things that happened that was so profound that I just blocked it off. I, mm -hmm. I really couldn't remember it. I mean, a lot of us have gone through that sort of thing, right? That performance-based acceptance, getting that, like you said, the pat on the head for good performance in one area where we're often comparing ourselves to an older sibling or somebody else who does it better or seems smarter, things like that. And then these incidences where they stick in our minds sometimes, sometimes, you know, we, we think, well, that wasn't that big of a deal, but it does make an impact on us. How do you start to think about the world? I mean, you described kind of how you started thinking about yourself as a result of this. How did it cause you to begin to see the world around you? Dan, we lived on a one-way street turned off the main highway, went to the, a new lake that was built. And we had a lot of transient traffic. We had a lot of campers that came up there. We were about 30 miles outside of a, a pretty large area. So it was just flooded with people on the weekend, people drinking, boating, swimming, picnicking. So we had all this traffic and, you know, my parents would like, we had a store and a boat dock and like, you know, be careful and don't talk to people you don't know. Don't get kidnapped. Fear just really came in. Hmm. And then during the week, we were the only ones that lived up there full time where there was only three houses on the street. So there were a lot of camps that were there. They were being robbed. So there was all this mischief going on all over the place. We were the only, the closest phone to this area. So we had all types of people that were coming up there being beat up, drunk. I was around all of that. 
actually one of the things that formed me most of all was when we were about 14, we were playing basketball in my front yard. And these three guys in a single cab pickup truck, which was unheard of now, but these three guys pulled down our driveway. Nobody's home, just my friend and I playing basketball. My dad's store was a quarter of a mile or so down the road, couldn't see it. And these guys got out and asked, you know, how do they get to the lake, to the spillway? So I told them and they kept coming toward us. And I realized they were intoxicated. You know, I told my buddy, I said, this is not good. I said, I don't know what their intentions are, but it's not good. So if they continue, you go one way, I'll go the other through the woods, which was our hiding place anyway. Thank goodness at 14, we were faster than they were in their drunken state, and they didn't catch us. But man, that had an impact on me. The bullying and all that really kind of got personified in that. This fear, but fear of being overpowered while I was a kid, you know, lots of water moccasins, lots of danger, but that was, that was just normal. That was part of living on a lake, hmm. but it was the people that were there that, that scared me. Thankfully, you were able to escape and no more damage was inflicted on you, but the potential for that was there. So you said the fear started to come in. Was there a little more you were going to say about that? You know, I made this agreement with myself, I thought. But really, in actuality, it was more with Satan because it wasn't with God. I'm never going to let that happen again. At 14, I wasn't big enough. But, you know, I started really working out, lifting weights, taking karate. My dad and I boxed all the time. I'll just be able to protect myself. That didn't turn out well, <laughs> you know, because that carried throughout the rest of my life. And if I go back and look at, you know, like I said, I was compliant, respectful, pleasing kid. Well, you know, later in high school, that was kind of blurred. Now I didn't want to be picked on him. And my dad's like, if you see you're going to get in a fight at school or something happens, you know, don't start the fight. But if somebody's picking on you, you throw the first punch. Well, gosh, I got in lots and lots and lots of fights. Uh, some of them were one punch fights, you know, because somebody would say something. I didn't argue. I didn't tell them what I was going to do. I just hit them in the face, hit them in the nose. Mm -hmm. And you start to build this, well, you know, I'm just going to be bad. But that was not my nature. That was not who I was. I didn't want to hurt people, but I didn't want to be bullied even more than that. So that kind of being the, the strong guy and taller than everybody else. And, you know, I was always a thin kid, so I wasn't a bully. But I didn't, I didn't take a lot off of anybody, and that's, that wasn't good. That was a bad pattern in my life. That agreement that you made, that vow really of saying, you know, I'm never going to let that happen again, began to drive some behaviors and some even relational interactions that were contrary to how God designed you. We can get into that a little bit more later, but it was around that time at about, I think, 15 years old, you said that you came to accept Jesus as your Savior. What brought you to that point? I mean, here you were wrestling with some of these fear issues as they're beginning to develop. How did you meet Christ? <laughs> it's interesting because I did a timeline um, years later, and I did the, you know, the kind of the good things that were happening. And then I came back and did the bad things, and they all seemed to be bunched together. So you had this 13, 14-year-old being bullied, the, the drunk guys, the learning to defend yourself, uh, and then all of a sudden... Christ is working in my life. I accept Christ. My dad walks down the aisle behind me. That was a pretty special night for us. Having Christ in my life, it's like, okay, but I didn't know anything. All I knew was that I loved him and I wanted to please him. But as far, I was in a Methodist church at the time. It was not, you know, it wasn't the strongest teaching church. Uh, so I didn't know anything. And, and that really carried on for the next almost quarter of a century uh, of trying to figure out who am I? What do I believe? You know, where, where are my people? I was grew up in the Methodist church. Kathy was Baptist. I had charismatic influence from my mom. We had Bible studies in my house that were more of that persuasion. I ended up going to Bible church that was, you know, dispensationalist, uh, Dallas theological background. So I had, you know, the extremes. And I, I found benefit in all of them. But I'm like, what do I believe? And it was a real struggle. It was hard to figure it out. I, I taught Sunday school. I was a deacon. I was did all these things, led worship. I'm front and center. 
but I'm still don't really know what I'm doing. You mm-hmm. know, I'm just struggling yeah. through trying to find my belief system. Yeah. Well, and as, as a people pleaser and then as somebody who wants to please God, oftentimes yeah. we jump right into service without uh, recognizing how we need our inner transformation as well, or at least the growth that comes from recognizing what Christ has done. Lauren, you had a question. So I think just we've we've heard your story, your childhood, how you met Christ, and we've kind of transitioned to adulthood. You've been following God for a while. So um, reading your story and hearing a little bit from you sounds like that's when you found freedom in Christ. Why don't you tell us about how you found it and uh, what was going on in your life and how did it change your life? I was introduced, I guess, first to Bill and Annabelle Gillum. I don't know if you remember that or not, Dan, but it was the Exchange Life series. Mm -hmm. And somebody introduced me to that. And I'd just maybe been less than a year reading about a lot of this, you know, identity-based acceptance. Uh, Then somebody said, you got to read this book by Neil Anderson called Victory Over the Darkness. And I read that. I read Bondage Breakers. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is it. This is the, the right balance between spirit and truth. He's not afraid of the spirit of God. He's talking that we have an enemy, but he's not overboard on that. And his, the teaching is really solid. So I'm like, all right, this is my people. Because I didn't, I didn't have a mentor after I was saved at 15. Uh, as a young man, all through my 20s and 30s, you know, no, no mentor. The men in my life were just not, they didn't offer that to me. So Neil sort of became my mentor through books. I read everything I could get my hands on that he wrote. I mean, just read it and read it and read it and read it. Started processing that in my life. Well, you know, as soon as you start to find the answer, immediately you want to go help other people. Or I did. I was a helper. So I started teaching it and just, boy, it all took off from there. <laughs> it's interesting, though, because the, the timeline thing again, all that's in my mid to late 30s. This exponential growth, teaching it, just being fulfilled. And my dad starts having strokes. He passed away when I was 39, a very difficult time. I'd had several things that had happened where I felt like I was bullied in some situations. And I mean, it went from a zero to a 10 in anger, just out of control anger. I I would even say rage. And I had my girls in the car with me and my wife, and we were going to the mall And anyway, this thing happened on a road with this 18-wheeler. It really triggered me, and I went from a zero to a 10 just in 30 seconds. And I was going to let my family off and follow this trucker till he pulled off or pulled him off. And my wife's like, you want us to get out of the car and walk to the mall and let you follow this trucker and do what with him? I'm like, I don't know, but I'll figure something out. I was just furious with this guy. So I came home that night. Got the kids in the bed. Kathy went to bed and I sat on my couch. It was midnight. And I'm like, God, this is, this is the kind of outburst of anger or rage that I could kill somebody, end up in prison and go, what in the world did you do? I mean, it was really out of character for me, but it had happened already six or seven different times from teenage on. I had not been through the steps at that point. I wasn't an angry person. I was not a, a, a real fighter, like I said. That, that happened, but I wasn't, that wasn't my nature. And I'm sitting there on the couch. I'm like, please show me what the deal is. And I can see these three guys driving down the driveway to my house when I'm 14 years old. And I'm 40 years old or 39 at the time. My heart beats 180, 90 beats a minute. It's just like it's happening real time. So I realized that something was stuck. For something to be almost a quarter of a century later, and it feels like it's real, that just never got dealt with. So I started looking for other little outbursts like that, things that were triggers that were happening, and it was all in the same area. Had I just dealt with anger, that wasn't the problem. The problem was fear. You know, I was scared to death that something was going to happen. And any time it looked like that, smelled like that, felt like that, I responded very similar fashion. Yeah. Sounds like you had like an actual trauma response, like your your body, you had a chemical response to that initial trauma. Wow. Thanks for being vulnerable and sharing that with us. So what about freedom in Christ changed you? You said that you realized that fear was the real problem, not anger. So what did you learn 
reading Neil's books, going through the steps, what did you learn that actually changed for you? What, what changed? Well, I wish I could tell you that it changed overnight and it just didn't. I mean, it's been years. It's been decades, which is really sort of why I did all the stuff that I did with people, because I was seeing the same response with them. We could identify, you know, five or six areas. You know, I had forgiveness issues. I had anger issues. I had pride issues. It really wasn't pride. It was just low self-esteem. It could mask itself with pride, but it really wasn't pride. It was just trying to be equal or measure up. So I had all these different pieces, Lauren, that I knew were there, but I didn't have them in any particular order. So I really had to just start going back and go, what's happened to me that's caused me to be this other than the bullying? And that was the main thing, but the, the trying too hard, the... Uh, it was just always exhausted. And one thing that really came out along that time was expectations and disappointments was a huge part of my life. Because I remember always being disappointed and, and praying to God and, and, and voicing this disappointment to him. And just, you know, the answer back from him was like, well, write down what you're disappointed about. So I remember writing down several things, seven, eight, ten things. You're like, no, look at the list carefully. Did I promise you any of those things? No. Well, there's a whole lot I promised you, but none of these things. This was all built out of my desire to please, to do, to perform, to have a, an impact for him. And he had put it in my mind to do things for him, but I'd taken it, overlaid it with my personality and personified it and, and blew it up into something that was... Still may happen, but it hasn't happened yet. Give you an example. When I we moved back from Tyler, Texas, back to Louisiana, I knew before we moved that I would be working with college kids. That was in 1988. I started working with college kids in 1997, nine years later. But that was in my heart all that time to do these things. Well, what do you do with something that's there in your heart for, for nine years? or like Moses in the desert for 40 years. You know, it's just like God lets that rest and resonate because maybe you're not ready, maybe the situation's not ready. And it was all, all of the above for me. I was learning the stuff by being introduced to freedom in Christ. There was really a revival going on in the mid nineties all across college campuses. I had no idea how that was going on, but it was happening on our campus. And it was just incredible. We bought box after box after box of Freedom of Christ and Bondage Breakers, our Bondage Breakers and Victor of the Darkness, and passed them out to hundreds and hundreds of kids. We ended up with about 1,000, 1,100 kids in this college group on a campus that was, you know, maybe 12,000 people. So we had a lot happening. You know, I started helping these kids. I started finding their freedom in Christ. But they were struggling with some of the same things that I was struggling with. There was instant relief in going through the steps and reading the books. There's this identity, and now I know who I am. But then it was almost worse when you would kind of trip up and do something stupid again that was out of character. It's like, well, what's, what's wrong with me? I mean, I thought I fixed this. Well, it's not fixed. It's still broken. But I had learned to live for 30, 40 years a certain way, and it was easy to fall back into those patterns. Yeah. But yeah. It, had it just been me, I told both of y'all, I would have thought something was wrong with me. Hmm. But I had the benefit of the experience of talking to literally hundreds of other people. I'm like, oh, this is common. This is just very natural, and it happens all the time. Hmm. I mean, I just want to highlight two things that you mentioned that I think are really important. One being that you felt like you had a calling and you had to wait nine years. I'm encouraged by that. I think even in my personal phase of life, like I'm 23, I have these big dreams and I feel like I'm in that waiting period of like, all right, I've got these big dreams. God, when am I going to get to do this for you? And so, right, right. yeah, I think that's just such a good reminder, like Moses in the desert. It's not punishment that he's having us wait, but he's like building us up and growing us. And by the time you're there working with college students, like 
man, it was time for revival and you got to be a part of something really cool. And the second thing I wanted to highlight is just, yeah, totally true what you're saying about it's easy to think, wait, I thought I got this figured out. I thought I conquered this. Like I recognized it. I confessed and I felt free for a little bit, but I slipped back in. I feel that for sure. I know Dan too, just, I mean, I could, I go through the steps every year and every year I'm like, wait, that again? <laughs> I thought I, I thought I got over this thing and see it come up in my life daily, but it's just, okay, there's so much grace from the Lord and um, just renewing your mind every single day and receiving that daily bread that Jesus has for us to give us strength to overcome these things that are just such strong patterns. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Dan, you have anything you want to say about that? I'm actually reading uh, a few books right now along those lines that have to deal with our emotions. And, you know, in Freedom in Christ, we do talk about the importance of being real with God, just like the psalmists, you know, were very gut level honest with God. And that's where we have to start. Uh, so, yeah, but those things can drive us if we're not aware of them, if we don't even name them and, and say, hey, I'm going to surrender that to the Lord. You know, I know I had to do a lot of work in my own life with shame and anger, dealing with those at the core of where they start is so critical. Honestly, though, part of what I had to learn is, uh, even like you said, you didn't end up following that 18-wheeler, thanks to your, your wife speaking truth into your life. But what I had to do is just stop the destructive behavior and back up and say, what's leading me to this point? Uh, what is causing me to do what I know is I don't want to do, you know, and it doesn't line up with who Christ has made me to be. And actually, Matt, that leads us into, I mean, you actually begin to visualize how to describe this to people. And you've actually now written a course about it. What does that look like? Tell us a little bit about those pictures and the course called uh, No Power Over Me. It really was born out of helping other people and trying to figure it out myself. You know, my, my twin daughters say, you're the most introspective person I've ever met. I'm like, baby, but the, you know, the goal of life is to know God and to know yourself. And I said, that's a lifelong process. I told my wife this getting ready for this for the podcast. I'm like, it's like walking into my office here. That's, you know, 16 by 14, whatever it is. And there being four or five feet of loose paper on the floor. So it's all the memories and the things that have happened to you in your life and, and how it affected you. And you're trying to, you know, sort through that, put it all in folders, categorize it and file it away neatly. And I'm like, it is such a mess. It's like, where do I start? It's like having a, a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle. Can I just see the box, <laughs> you know, where I can know what the outline's supposed to look like? The teachings were good and the steps were helpful and I felt immediate relief and so did the other people. But it's like, we're still missing cause and effect because people would come to see you and they would say, I had an affair. Uh, I've got an anger issue. Uh, I've got a porn issue. I've got a lust issue. I've got a, you know, usually something sexual involved, but it was something else that was the problem, some action or, or emotion. Nobody ever came to me and said, you know, Matt, I really have a fear issue uh, or I've got a control issue. It was always what that was causing. And my attempt to understand, I would have a whiteboard in my office on, or a piece of paper. And as people would, would go through the steps and they would say, you know, here are the six or seven things they've gone through, I would write them on the board. So when we would get through, I'm like, so these are the seven things that you just confessed and repented of and, you know, you're intending to turn and walk away from these things. Do you have any concept or idea of what happens first? We know the, outfit, the outlier was, in my case, was anger, but what came before that? And they could name one or two things that were happening before. They'd have to go back and, and get in the situation and go, well, yeah, you know, it kind of was... Before I really got angry, I was really fatigued or something else happened. And they would kind of come up with a pattern, but a lot of times it wasn't consistent. So they really struggle with putting all that in pieces, in, or pieces and putting it into the place. So we would go through maybe another six, eight weeks of trying to figure out this order. As we would work back to the center, it ended up being fear and control over and over and over. But they never could identify that. 
I was the one that was like, was there anything that happened in your life that created a lot of fear? Uh, well, yeah, but they, could, they weren't coming up with that on their own. They just know the behavior. An example, and I just thought about this the other day. My granddad lived in this little town and there was a railroad track behind his house, maybe four or 500 yards. I could hear the train. It was really thick woods between, you know, where he lived in the train. Uh, and he said, never go back to the railroad tracks. He was trying to keep me from going back there and getting hit by the train. But his reasoning was there's hobos on the train and the hobos will get you. So I was scared to death of the train. That's when I was, you know, seven, eight, 10 years old. I'm dropping off my kids to go to church. I'm in this 39 to 40 year old range again. I dropped them off because we were late and I was parking the car over and there was a railroad track right by the church. And I parked by the railroad track. I'm walking back across to go in the side door of the church. Train's coming. My first response was hide behind the dumpster. I'm like, hide behind the dumpster? <laughs> it's a train. But I had not even associated that that fear and that train was connected. And, and that's been, you know, 20, 30 years, 35 years later, 40 years later. And it was just as real to me to hide as anything. But it was not rational. It was just a, a response. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was seeing with, all, with myself and these other people. These, these things that happened in our life, we didn't know why they had happened. And we couldn't associate that. It was a fear that came in that my granddad didn't mean to give to me, but he did. And that had caused me to be afraid of a train. Well, it's much more practical in other areas. Anytime anybody got into my face or was disrespectful, made me think that I was less than or that they're bullying me on, on, the, on the highway all the time. People don't bully you face to face, but they bully you on, on the highway. That's one of my trigger points. I'm okay if you want to go faster than me and I'm in your way, I'll move over. But don't act like you're going to run over me. I will slow down to 20 just to make you upset. I'm like, that's real mature, you know. How old are you, Matt? <laughs> you know, <laughs> But that's how I feel. And because you're endangering me and you're endangering my family and, and I don't like your attitude. Where does that happen all the time? It happens on the road. And now I'm just like, okay, God, I'll pray for those people. Just get out of the way and let them go do their thing. Don't let it upset me. Don't be offended by that. Just move out of the way. And I'll say, like, I even, I used one of your diagrams the other day, the one you were just talking about with the uh, out of control emotions on the outside and moving towards the inside, going past critical spirit, success, fail, worldly success, control, back down to fear, even just visualizing what's happening, but then getting down to the root cause. Because I think... How this becomes really helpful partnered with going through the steps to freedom is when you go through the steps to freedom, you realize like, OK, this is what's happening. Like I have a problem with this. Say it's anger in your case. And you can get through some of those layers, but it's some, a lot of times it takes more time than you can do just sitting in the steps to get down to the very, very, very root of it. And so that's why I love your free resource is it really helps you identify, OK, Anger is a problem, but where does it come from? It comes from this place of fear and needing to control because of your fear. So I, yeah, I'm super thankful just for the, your resource. Even in my own life, it's been so helpful for me. Well, I had to identify my fear. It had, you know, it had four different components. It wasn't just fear. It was fear of being overpowered, you know, fear of not measuring up and control. I mean, I knew I wanted to be in control because there's one question you always ask yourself. If you know you're struggling with control, why? I always want to know why something happened. And that's the wrong question. My wife has struggled with her health a lot. And I've, you know, I'm like, God, why are you letting that happen? Now I'm just relaxing and going, God, you are in me. You are in her. You love us. You know everything that's going on. I trust you with that. Please help my unbelief. I don't need to know why. I just need to know that you're in control. To not be in control, there's such an element of trust, which is part of our faith. But it's really interesting, Lauren, in this, you've got this the sin circle. I actually ended up doing it for an aggressive personality, more like my own, and a passive personality. Uh, because you'll have both of those. Yeah. And I was working on this, getting my car fixed, and this girl had on a chosen t-shirt, so we talked, you know, briefly. And I said, well, you know, nice talking to you. I got to finish the study I'm working on. I had my computer. 
well, what are you working on? And I said, well, it's a study for this ministry, this freedom of Christ. And well, do you have anything about depression in there? So I'm like, okay, shut the computer, sat down. We started talking and I said, are you depressed? Yeah. Well, why are you depressed? See, that's the outside of the circle. I'm depressed. Mm -hmm. Well, why? So I said, let me, let me show you this. I showed her the passive sin circle and she looks at it and just starts, I mean, tears rolling down her face. And she said, how did you do this? I said, what do you mean? She said, how did you put it in the exact order of my life? That is exactly my life. And the control that's not in the center, but was up higher in that passive model. Hers was a, a eating disorder. She said, I just had to be in control of something because I was in control of nothing. Hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's more of you being in control versus control being taken from you by somebody else. And you just kind of fade into the background. And really, we kind of weave in between those two. It's never either or, it's sort of both. Hopefully, it's a, a tool that lets people go, okay, I just got to pray through this, write these things down, do the timelines, and see when these things happen, and then put it into a graph form. And then forget it. You know, you don't have to go back and keep looking at it. You forget it. It's like, now I understand that's the scheme of the enemy that, you know, Dan, we say don't be ignorant of his schemes. And the word literally means, you know, in the mind, there's a a method that Satan attacks me. And it was always through this same Mm -hmm. pattern. Yeah. And it's so important to understand that because, I mean, what we've been talking about, whether it's depression or anger, that's what we call the presenting problem, right? That's what, what presents outwardly. But... Once you understand, oh, this comes from this, which comes from this, which comes from the root issue, Uh, and what you found so often is fear and control. I've got a thought on that in just a minute. But then when the presenting problem happens, you can actually go directly to the Lord with the actual core issue and just say, okay, Lord, what is it that I'm afraid of? What is it? And that's where, I mean, sometimes like with control, we try and control something because we can't control God and we are afraid he's going to either disappoint us or abuse us like other people have. And yet that's not his character. How have you seen your faith in Christ, biblical understanding of what it means to take your thoughts captive and walk in freedom? How have you seen that? help you and others overcome those core issues like fear and control. The second part of the study is, um, I called it the 16 pitfalls. It was understanding what you were thinking that was causing that fear and the, and the need to be in control. One of my main things was the expectations and disappointments that was in that not trying to control, but what's my thinking like with my wife, we've talked about this, you know, on our board, why are we struggling with such, you know, so many physical things happening with our spouses? Well, if I don't understand that that's not God's intention for that to be happening, he created a world without that sin entered and death entered and and sickness entered with that. Well, I'm going to blame it on God. If I think that God has the power to do something and he doesn't do it, then it's either something wrong with God or something wrong with me. And I knew it wasn't wrong with God. So it had to be me. But a lot of people don't accept Christ simply because he didn't answer their prayer. It's more than just identifying the, the fear and the control, but what's the thinking that's leading to that? Where, where's my theology mm-hmm. off? Where's my yeah. understanding of God off? My wife had bypass surgery last year, and it's like having a blockage in your system, and blood's not bringing life to your organs. You got to go in and get rid of the, the blockage. You got to mm-hmm. bypass it. God made us in his image with a mind, with emotions, with the ability to choose. One of the books I'm reading right now is called Cry of the Soul by Dan Allender and Tremper Longman. You know, and they talk about how our emotions, we so often look at them as being horizontal between us and other people. But they actually make the statement that every emotion we experience is actually a theological statement. At the core, it reflects what we believe about God, right? And so that's why we need to be aware. A lot of times we're less willing to be aware and in tune with those negative emotions. We want to avoid them, get rid of them as soon as possible, or even as Christians often think, well, I shouldn't feel that way, rather than saying, God, what am I feeling? 
And how is that causing me to relate to you in a way that is not your intended design, which then is reflected in our relationships with others? So what you're working on and and what we're trying to make as free or as cost-effective as possible is this no power over me, demolishing Satan's lies. Thank you for writing that. Thank you for visualizing it to be able to help people say, how did you just describe my life? And point to Jesus as the answer through his spirit at work in us, through the fellowship of his body, ultimately all based on the truth of his word. What do you hope people uh, get out of that? We talked about, you know, being normal before, you know, I told my girls, I'm like, you you had as, as normal of an upbringing as possible, but it's not necessarily what happened to you in your life, but how you perceive what happened. Because two kids can come from the same house and they got different perspectives on what happened. And I guess, you know, once you identify these patterns that the, that the enemy has against you and how you've allowed yourself to be manipulated and then move on to the place where you realize that Christ is in me. The Father is in Christ, he's in me, the Spirit is in me, and he's going to cause me to walk all this stuff out. And there's one passage, y'all, that, that kind of sums it up for me. And I just heard this in a sermon just in the last couple of weeks. It's just sort of like a warm blanket out of, the, out of the dryer that you put over yourself. In John 13, where Peter is talking to Jesus and he says, you know, I would, I'd die for you. He's like, Peter, before... The sun rises, you're going to deny me three times. Oh, no, not me. I'll die for you. You know, and in the first part of chapter 14, the guy said that's really kind of a chapter break that shouldn't be there. Even after he's going to do this, he says, you know, just don't let your heart be troubled. Trust in God and trust in me. So in my mindset, with the performance being the whole thing, if Jesus is telling me that I'm going to do something, then... I'm going to think and like, how can I guard against this? How can I be alert so this doesn't happen? Be sober, be vigilant, head it off before it happens. I mean, pray all night long, do more, do more, do more, Matt. And Jesus didn't say that. He didn't say that don't do that. Don't deny me. He's like, I know you're going to deny me. I, I know that you're boastful. I know it's in you. It's okay. I'm creating this person in you that's going to do a lot of good stuff. But you're in the process <coughs> on becoming who you're supposed to be, I'm working that out in you. Just believe in me. That's just not how I lived my life, Dan and Lauren. You know, it was just, the, the effort is what drove me. It was my friend. It got me where I got to in my career. And it just didn't translate well into the faith because it's exactly the opposite. Just to decrease and let him increase. And it was, boy, that was a hard transition. Mm, yeah, it's so important. He says, if you abide in me, you'll produce fruit. You know, right. Not if you try harder, That's you'll right. produce fruit. And uh, But it's hard to submit to that. And yeah, it is. Matt, thank you so much for sharing your story today. I know it's going to encourage a lot of our listeners. It's been good to hear your story. You can find Matt's free resource on our website. There's a banner on our homepage. You can click on it from there, or you can find it under our free resources page. You can download the studies, all the diagrams, and there's even some videos. So make sure you check out his free study and share it with your friends. Thanks so much, Matt. We really enjoyed having you today. Thank you, guys. You too. Bye-bye. Well, Dan, I thought that was just an awesome interview. I loved hearing Matt's story and hearing about his new resource. Yeah, I think that this is going to be a good discussion. I'm excited to hear what you have to say. When we had talked, we had um, mentioned that something that stood out to both of us was right there towards the end when he said that effort became his friend. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and he described how even if the Lord told him to do something, he would immediately begin to think, what do I need to do to make that happen, right? How do I need to in a sense, power up and get this accomplished. And he, he said, effort was my friend. And I just remember back in the days when I was working really hard to overcome some addiction and some sinful tendencies that were deep within me, I remember a statement that you have to grieve giving up what has become a quote-unquote reliable friend, right? Because... Mm. Sin is attractive in the short run. Otherwise, 
who would do it, yeah. right? But ultimately, it fails us. It leads us astray. It betrays us. And yet, it helps us in the moment. Even like the, the young lady that he was saying, the eating disorder was something that she could control and give her that sense of control in the moment. But ultimately, that's betraying her, right? Turning against her. It's something damaging and harmful. But we have to grieve something that really is harmful for us. And sometimes that feels strange to even think about it. But it's become a friend that comforts us in a time of pain, in a time of fear. So I just want to encourage people to think about what do they need to say, oh, I'm I'm going to be willing to give up or even grieve the loss of turning to this presenting problem and try and get to the core issues and deal with those core issues. We were talking a minute ago about how my wife and I would talk about how events trigger issues. And in young couples, in she and I, we realized, wait, there was an, an event that really was a one or two like Matt was saying, though, but it, in me, it brought about a response at a nine or a 10. Well, if that happens and the response is disproportionate to the event itself, that means that event has triggered an issue. And so we can all say, okay, when my response is out of character, what issue do I need to get to? And you said that the diagram that he put in his study was even helpful for you. What does that look like, you know, in your life? Or can you describe it for our listeners? What is that diagram that helps you get to the core issue? The diagram has been super helpful for me and in my relationships. It kind of looks like, imagine almost like a semicircle or a rainbow. And on the very outside layer is the symptom, the thing that's happening, whether it be um, anger or lashing out, just like a strong emotion. And then it gets more detailed um, as you move in towards the bottom. Um, and the very center in the one that Matt was explaining is fear. When you use the resource, what I found super helpful is there's actually a blank diagram also. There's an example diagram, but there's also a blank one that you can print off and and do your own and go, okay, I just reacted like this. Let me figure out why. And just like even just sitting there and asking God, like, all right, Lord, <laughs> I reacted like this. I reacted with a nine to a situation that my reaction should have been a one or a two. What's going on here? Because... God really wants you to find healing and freedom. And so when you ask him, he answers, whether that's through scripture or through his still small voice or through a friend that you're willing to listen to. When you ask him to expose those things, he really will. And so the diagram has been super helpful for me, even to just be able to connect the dots and go, this leads to this, leads to this, leads to this. That's why I'm acting out. It's really not the symptom. That's the problem. It's, it's the root. So yeah, it's been it's been super helpful for me mm. and for other people in my life that I've brought it to. That's awesome. And and one of the things I think we need to hear is that like in my life, I said I had to stop the destructive behavior that resulted yeah. as out of my anger. But I couldn't figure out immediately those things that were below that, right? Yeah. And so that's where for example, the steps to freedom are so helpful because we're inviting the Father, the one who knows all to reveal to our minds the things that are lying beneath the symptoms, those outward mm -hmm. behaviors or the things that we don't want to continue to do. God knows uh, what's going on. Like we talked about Psalm 139, you know, God has searched us. He knows us. He knows uh, when we sit down, when we rise up, he discerns our thoughts from afar. He searches out our path and are acquainted with all our ways. He even says, even before a word is on my tongue, behold, Lord, you know it all together. And there's so much more in that psalm that, that addresses that. He knows what's in our hearts. You know, but also Proverbs, uh, what is it, verse uh, chapter 20, verse 5, says the, the purposes in a man's heart are like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Well, yeah. we want to understand what's driving yeah. these things that don't reflect the image and character of Christ in us yeah. so that we can, you know, submit them to him and allow him to change us from the inside out. And I found that once those core issues were addressed, the outward behaviors really just dissipated. 
I didn't have to do a lot of work after that. They weren't being driven by those negative emotions. God changes us uh, from the inside out. Yeah, that's so good. And even, I think we all want to change and we all want to get better, but it's a lack of understanding of what's really going on. And that's why Freedom in Christ, the steps, um, reading the books, Victory of the Darkness, and this free resource are all so helpful is because, like Proverbs says, our minds are like deep waters and we can't really change until we understand what's going on. And so that's why these tools to help you understand are so helpful. Cause I mean, all of his whole study is the 16 pitfalls that most believers fall into and helps break down. This is how we get to this and here's how we can move forward. And so I mm-hmm. think that that understanding, making the the pieces connect is what's so helpful in actually making a change and taking a step towards looking more like Christ. Yeah. And it really is so critical for our walk with God to understand what's going on in us. I mean, from Augustine and Aquinas to Calvin and and modern day, that whole concept of we have to know ourselves to know God, and we have to know God to understand ourselves. It's not the New Age concept of I'm God, not at all. But if I'm not aware of what's going on inside, then I'm putting on a front. I'm not being honest with myself and with God. And if I can't be honest with God, I can't be walking with him in in great freedom and intimacy. So we need to to know ourselves. We pray this has been an encouragement to everyone who's listening. If you're struggling with something that you don't know where it's come from, this No Power Over Me resource can help you discern some of the core issues behind it. As we know, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Thank you for being with us today.